All right, folks, we're back. And I thought I would take the opportunity today to do uh, one more equilibrium calculation for you and then move on to a concept called Le Chatier's Principle. Now, you've heard of Le Chatier's Principle earlier in the year, and we're going to talk about it again. So let's begin by doing example 7 in your notes, um, an equilibrium problem. We have carbon monoxide gas reacting with water vapor to produce hydrogen uh, gas and carbon dioxide gas. The equilibrium constant is pretty small here, 0.227. So we're going to place 0.1 moles of carbon monoxide in the same amount of moles of water vapor in a rigid 1 liter container. And since I gave you the equilibrium constant, we are going to solve for the equilibrium concentrations of all species. So we're going to start by writing the equation over again. CO plus H2O, and these are all in the gas phase, kiddos. I'm just leaving that out for right now. Makes hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And once again, KEQ is given 0.227. Now, when the equilibrium constant is given, we're going to be asked to find equilibrium concentrations. So we're going to start with the initial amount. In fact, why don't I do this for you today? Why don't we uh, take the opportunity to see if you can solve this problem without my help? Um, so why don't you pause the video right now, uh, work on this problem as far as you can, and then come back to the video, and we'll see how you did, okay? All right, see you in a second. Bye-bye. All right, welcome back. So we have um, initial concentration, so that's going to be in terms of molarity. So we have 0.1 moles in a 1 liter container. So that's 0 0.100 molar carbon monoxide gas and the same amount of water vapor, 0 0.100 molar. We don't have any hydrogen or carbon dioxide initially. We don't know how much this goes down by and give you a percentage at all. So we're just going to say this will go down by x. And since it's a one-to-one -one ratio on the reactant side, the water vapor will go down by whatever that amount is. The hydrogen and carbon dioxide will go up by that amount, plus x and plus x, because it's also a one-to-one -one ratio. So at equilibrium, we have 0 0.100 minus x, 0 0.100 minus x, x, and x. All right, let's write our equilibrium expression now. KEQ is hydrogen gas concentration at equilibrium times carbon dioxide gas all over carbon monoxide and water vapor concentrations at equilibrium. Now, we do know their equilibrium concentrations in terms of X, so let's continue this down here. We have X for the hydrogen gas and X for the carbon dioxide gas, and 0.1 minus X quantity squared for both the CO and the water vapor. In fact, I think we can change that numerator since it's just X times X. Let's just go ahead and make that X squared. And that equals our equilibrium constant of 0.227. So we have a second-order polynomial. We could work this by using the quadratic formula, but let's do it a little easier way. Since we can take the square root of both sides pretty easily, let's do that. So the square root of 0.227 is 0.476 equals the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 0.1 minus x quantity squared is 0.1 minus x. So let's go ahead and clear our denominator. So we have 0.476 times 0.1 minus x equals x. And now we'll go ahead and distribute the 0.476 through the 0.1 and the negative x. So 0.476 times 0.1 is 0 0.0476. Let's do that down here, 0 0.0476. And 0.476 times a negative x is a negative 0.476x, and that equals x. Now I'll combine like terms, so I'm going to add 0.476x's to both sides. And we'll get rid of that. 
and we end up with 0 0.0476 equals 2, uh, sorry, 1, 1.476x. And we'll divide both sides by 1.476, and we'll end up solving for x. So 0 0.0476 divided by 1.476 gives me 0 0.0322. Now, how does that help me answer my question? Because I wanted to have the equilibrium concentrations. Well, don't I know those concentrations in terms of x? So I should be able to handle that. Um, it looks like my CO concentration will equal the water vapor concentration, which is x. Sorry, it's not x. It is 0 0.100 minus x. And so that would be 0 0.100 minus our 0 0.0322. And that gives me 0 0.0678. Moles per liter of hydrogen uh, gas and carbon monoxide. Sorry, water vapor and carbon dioxide. And then finally, my hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide gas concentration. Now, those will be equal, and those are simply X, which in this case is 0 0.0322 molar. Okay, so we found our equilibrium concentrations. A little bit of effort. But, um, but hopefully you guys were successful at it, okay? All right, let's introduce Le Chatelier's principle uh, with the time we have remaining on this video. And then we have some examples to do, and I have a video uh, demonstration for you coming up as well um, in the next video segment. So in, in 1888, a French chemist, um, Henri-Louis Le Chatelier, discovered that there are ways to control equilibria to make reactions more productive. He proposed what is now known as Le Chatelier's principle, which simply says, if a stress is applied to a system at equilibrium, the system will shift in a direction that will relieve the stress. Now, a stress is any kind of change in a system at equilibrium that can upset that equilibrium. So, let's just take a look at the example at the top of the next page. We have, um, nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas reacting to form ammonia. And this is an exothermic reaction. Heat is produced in this reaction. So let's start stressing this system out. One way we can stress the system is by adding gaseous reactants or products. So if I add nitrogen gas or hydrogen gas, I increase their concentrations. I want to use them up. So we would say that the equilibrium, in order to use those up, would shift to the right. We would produce more ammonia gas. Here, let's look at it this way. The equilibrium expression for this reaction is NH3 squared over N2 and H2 concentrations cubed. Now, if I were to increase uh, the concentration of nitrogen gas or hydrogen gas. In other words, I make my denominator bigger. The KEQ kiddos has to stay constant. So if I make nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas concentration bigger by adding more reactant to the system, doesn't my numerator also have to get bigger to compensate for that so my equilibrium constant stays constant? So in order to do that, we would have to make more ammonia. So in order to do that, we would shift it to where the ammonia is, and that's on the right-hand side of the equation. Okay? All right. What if I decrease the amount of ammonia? All righty. So now let's look at our equilibrium expression here. We can look at it that way. If the amount of ammonia drops, okay, so I'm dropping the amount of ammonia, what has to happen uh, to the amount of nitrogen and hydrogen in order for my equilibrium constant to remain constant? Yeah, it's going to have to be used up, isn't it? So it's going to have to go down. Well, how does the amount of nitrogen and hydrogen go down? How do I make that go down? 
well, I have to make more product. I have to make more of what I just took away. So in this situation, the equilibrium would also shift towards the right, and I would make more ammonia gas to compensate for the ammonia that I took out. That's how I would relieve the stress. All right, what about temperature changes? So we could increase or decrease the temperature. In this particular case, I'm making it hotter. I'm increasing the temperature. Now, as we said a moment ago, that this reaction is exothermic. Heat is produced. So if I were to relieve the stress after I added heat, would I move to the right, where I can create more heat, or would I move to the left, where it would use up that heat? That's right. In this case, it would shift away from the heat, so this would shift left. And in shifting left, the concentration of nitrogen and hydrogen would go up and the ammonia would go down. Remember, changing temperature will also change the value of the equilibrium constant. So let me go through that temperature change one more time. And the way we did this earlier in the year, you might remember, is we used the little girl coming in from the cold. So I'll draw the little girl here again. Right? If I increase the temperature, if I make it hotter, is she going to go towards the fireplace and get even hotter, or is she going to go away from the fireplace and cool down? That's right. In this situation, she's going to go away from the heat when it gets hot. Now, if it got cold, then yes, she would shift to the right. Okay? All right. Now, how about increasing pressure? Now, increasing pressure, since we're uh, dealing with gases, is the same as decreasing the volume, and what that will do is increase the concentration. So I'm going to say increase the concentration of all species. Now, let's erase this because this is getting a little bit claustrophobic up here. If we increase the pressure on this system, we want to go to the side where there's less gas. So to the side with less gas. Remember, gases take up space equal moles of gases, of, or excuse me, one mole of any gas has the same volume so long as the temperature and pressure are the same. So when I increase the pressure, I want to go to the side where there's less volume or less gas. So in this reaction, I have a nitrogen gas and three hydrogen gas gases. So don't I have four moles of gases on the left side? On the right side, I have two ammonia gases. So if I increase the pressure, I want to go to the side where there's less gas, and that would be the ammonia side, which is on the right. So we would say that would shift right, and if I increase the pressure, I would produce more ammonia gas. And then finally, if I add a catalyst, adding a catalyst does not shift the equilibrium. It will simply help you get to the equilibrium sooner. So it doesn't change the delta H of the reaction, and it does not shift the equilibrium. So adding a catalyst will get you there sooner, but it will not shift the equilibrium. Okay? All right. When we come back, we're going to do some more examples, and then I have a video demonstration for you as well. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.